Cool. Looks like just about everybody uh, getting set, getting ready for our exciting about an hour or so today, uh, depending on how questions go and depending on how much coffee that Bernie and I have had. Uh, so th this session, we're super excited to present essentially a, a uh, overview of what Alan and Heath and Oddnet's Dante protocol uh, bring to the table when we talk about install generally uh, for this all install week, but more specifically tying into the, the world of education. And I'll be spending a little bit of time kind of looking at even what we mean when we say education and what sort of spaces we think you know, fall into education land and maybe what kind of spaces don't. Um, what's unique about it that we might want to care about and, and how we can bring um, Alan and Heath and Dante to bear to solve the specific requirements and I think unique needs of the education space. So that's kind of what we'll be up to today. We'll obviously allow some time for questions um, at, at the end. And if you've got some, I think you can put those in the Q&A. We'll have folks kind of helping corral and maybe even answer some of those along the way if they're easy enough to answer just in text or we'll save them for the end and come around uh, and have the experts tackle those. Um, as best as we can. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and kick it off here. Um, I'm super excited to hear what Bernie's got for us uh, to talk about as far as the uh, Dante platform itself and a little history, I believe, uh, about Oddnet. Um, and just real quick, unless you you know, in case you haven't seen or heard from Bernie, he's pretty famous. I assume most of you know Bernie, uh, but he is the senior technical sales engineer at Oddnet, and his responsibilities really are to help facilitate uh, the wide adoption of Dante. So by all accounts, he's doing an awesome job. Um, obviously, Dante is everywhere. So he works uh, at developing the education and training programs for Oddnet. Um, and this training really supports Oddnet's OEM distribution channels. So companies like Allen and Heath, um, and also kind of work with AV design consultants and system integrators. And he's got over 34 years of experience. Um, doesn't look one, one day over 33 years of experience. Oh. Um, <laughs> including roles as a system designer, uh, project manager, field applications engineer, sales engineer, uh, aspiring drummer, it seems. Uh, his work history includes key roles with companies such as Electrosonics, Wheatstone, uh, which we talked about a really cool uh, uh, time he had there, and uh, Clear One Communication. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Bernie uh, to talk to us about Dante. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff. So. Um... Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Get this uh, presentation up. And you should be uh, hopefully seeing a full screen. And so um, what I want to do for those of you, uh, hopefully you've probably heard of you know, Dante by, by now. Uh, but it, again, this is just a brief overview. So, you know, Audinate, you know, we're the company behind Dante. It's a 100 100% interoperable solution. And we make chips, cards, software that we sell to our manufacturing partners. And these run the variety or run the gamut from little two by two chips all the way up to uh, 512 by 512 chips and uh, various uh, uh, software versions of, of those. We make software for end users, Dante Virtual Sound Card, Dante Controller. Uh, we have some software for our OEM partners as well. Uh, we also make, uh, um, you know, uh, a piece of software that I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, during the presentation called Dante Domain Manager, which uh, lets you manage and monitor and expand a Dante network over a layer three uh, enterprise uh, network. Um, so we are headquartered in Sydney and we've got a, a, an army of engineers down there, not only working on designing, uh, you know, new implementations of Dante, you know, we've, we've got the, you know, the Dante AV product, but we also have folks dedicated uh, for training. Uh, Patrick Kalani recently joined us uh, about two years ago, I believe. Uh, he's heading up uh, the training department. We've got, uh, we're expanding our support department. So we basically are that one-stop uh, shop for everything Dante from an OEM perspective. And we have worldwide representation uh, headquartered in Sydney, but offices here in the US, uh, Portland, Oregon, as well as multiple offices in the UK. Uh, we have uh, offices in the uh, Philippines, 
Philippines, um, but uh, people distributed worldwide. So primarily what we do is we make these chips and cards. And again, they are for the OEM customers and they put them into their various products. Dante, uh, currently as it stands, we have 17 times the adoption rate of the closest competitor, which is not, you know, ABB or, uh, you know, Cobernet or anything like that. It's actually a uh, um, Ravina, which is uh, more of a broadcast uh, uh, audio over IP protocol. We've got, uh, currently we have um, over 360 OEMs supplying shipping Dante enabled products, okay? And so we have, uh, it's been growing year by year and so forth. We have up to 518 OEM brands developing these products. So 360 have actually shipped or have announced products for the market. The remaining 133, they're developing their first Dante enabled product. And this is not only traditional Dante audio, but with Dante AV, which uh, was uh, just recently announced that there are Dante AV products available to purchase. So we've got uh, PTZ cameras as well as encoders and decoders from uh, Bowen and Patton. So that was uh, some big news, some exciting news. But um, more about the audio, that's typically what you uh, associate Dante with. And in education, what I wanna do is go through some uh, audio uh, not only uh, K through 12, but higher education quite a bit. And with Dante, um, it's used in classrooms, lecture halls, conference rooms, you know, the typical scenario where you've got some form of automatic mixer, microphones, uh, speakers, maybe uh, some computer applications, you know, maybe you're using Dante virtual sound card for uh, interfacing to uh, Teams, Zoom, you know, blue jeans, et cetera. But um, that's typically one application you'll see on campus. But there's many more. Uh, of course, uh, we got our start in live sound. And um, so it's natural that you know, many theaters and performing arts centers use Dante. And uh, not only that, it goes right into the stadiums, arenas, athletic facilities of a campus and so forth that will be used, um, uh, where, where Dante will be used on, on the campus. Now, you know, and of course, recording production and or broadcast facilities on a campus, whether it's a single, you know, recording studio, or if it's an entire building that acts as the production, you know, recording um, uh, education uh, center for that. Uh, we have seen Dante go in all of these systems, okay? Now, typically, you know, these are traditional Dante systems. And, you know, if we hopped in the uh, time machine and went back, uh, let's say, you know, six or seven years, you would see these, you know, a traditional Dante had to be on a, everything had to be on the same VLAN, a single subnet. And you would see all these Dante devices appear in Dante controller. Now, uh, in the early days, this was a dedicated standalone network. And, um, or, you know, if it was on the uh, campus uh, network, it would be a, uh, there would be like a dedicated Dante VLAN. But again, still a single subnet. So what you would see uh, in a, campus situation, you'd see little individual islands of Dante throughout the campus. Each one, you know, would be, you know, even though they might be using the campus infrastructure, they were kind of dedicated uh, for their own specific uh, departments. Maybe you had the education center, maybe you had, you know, the, uh, the, the stadium, they're all using Dante, but totally separate, no interconnectivity between them. So this is where Dante Domain Manager comes in into play and DDM as we call it is a real key component in taking things to the next level because what Dante Domain Manager does is it allows you to organize your Dante systems, secure them, and most importantly expand them. Uh, DDM uh, and, and these images you see here we have a browser image that's what the DDM server uh, puts up on a web page and uh, then it works in conjunction with Dante controller, okay? So you, the, the, there's really no change to the workflow in a Dante uh, domain manager environment, especially from the end user, uh, the technician, the audio tech or AV tech's perspective. You're still using Dante controller. You just now have to log in. So DDM is a server application that organizes, secures, enhances Dante networks, 
Now it affects the control only, so it's not in the audio signal path in any way, shape or form. So it's mainly there to allow you to create what we call Dante domains. And a Dante domain is nothing more than a Dante system. And it's not just the devices, the Dante devices in that system, it also consists of users who have distinct roles that have access to those systems. So the DDM server sits there somewhere on the network it can be in the same subnet as Dante devices or in a completely different subnet. It's control only. If the DDM server were to go away for whatever reason, your audio still functions. So it allows you to organize your systems into Dante domains. It provides security because now individuals have to log in to their Dante systems or their Dante domains. And it allows you to expand the system to um, where you can have, uh, you know, just over a, a thousand devices is the largest DDM system we have out there right now. We've got customers that want to do more, but we've tested up to like 1200 Dante devices in a, in a uh, DDM environment. And what this means is your devices can live not only in one subnet, but you can create what we call, you know, a multi subnet Dante domain. So you, you can have devices in different subnets all act as one system and in Dante controller on the routing tab, it looks like a traditional Dante system. So server base for enhanced functionality uh, everywhere. And again, Dante controller is how you uh, log in and make changes to the system. So what you're doing though, is uh, with the DDM server on the network, you can create these independent Dante domains. And then when you create a Dante domain, each one of those domains or Dante domains is a clocking domain. So each one will have its clock, own clock leader or you know, formerly grandmaster clock. So each one of these, Studio A has its own cl uh, clock leader, Studio B has a clock leader and so forth. They're all isolated. So there's no sharing of audio between these by default, uh, but we do have that capability um, in the DDM software. So you can create a domain based on whatever you feel like. It can define, uh, a Dante domain could be a single you know, lecture hall, or it could be a group of lecture halls. It could be an entire building of lecture halls. And then you can assign those users to those domains. Now, traditionally, um, again, you would have uh, a lot of gear in that uh, uh, campus system, in, in the stadium. You got your mixers, uh, DSPs, amplifiers, speakers, et cetera, all these Dante enabled devices. So that could be a single Dante domain. You've got the broadcast building, which could, uh, or, or a production studio building uh, with multiple studios. That could be another Dante domain with, again, individuals that only accessed, that have access to the uh, uh, broadcast uh, facilities. You can have that performing arts center too. It could be, you know, multiple theaters. There could be, you know, each theater in that performing arts center could be its own Dante domain. And then finally in the classrooms and lecture halls and so forth, you can create these Dante domains. They can live on that enterprise network. Uh, these devices can be in different subnets and you just, uh, uh, you know, work your system, configure your system like you normally would in Dante controller. Um, and cross subnet support for campus in, environments is really uh, key because um, traditionally, um, again, it wasn't that big of a deal for an IT department to, you know, create a, a Dante um, a VLAN. Uh, but what would happen sometimes is, you know, an amp room would be in a, on a different floor and therefore the IT department would want to adhere to its rules of like, you know, it's going to be in a different subnet. DDM allows that to happen. So you can have all these different um, types of Dante systems exist on your campus with devices being in the same or different subnets. And uh, DDM allows you to have that uh, cross subnet support. We do not pass any multicast timing or multicast audio uh, packets across the network. That's one key difference. So it's all unicast traffic that we send across the router. Okay, multicast audio and multicast uh, PTP packets are still used in designated subnets, uh, the, the home subnet, uh, but uh, again, nothing uh, with regards to multicast is crossing the uh, router. So what this gives you the ability to do is to allow uh, all sorts of things. And so, you know, during you know, the last year and a half, remote work has been a big 
a big deal. And remote support staff can now monitor and make changes to the Dante, their Dante systems from their own computer. And if they have VPN access, um, they can log in uh, to the uh, DDM server itself using the browser and look at the status of the domains that they are in charge of. And they can also connect up with Dante controller and you know, make those changes, make routing changes, uh, device changes, et cetera, all from the comfort of their, uh, their home. So that's been one of the key advantages with DDM. Um, the ability to create individual users um, is key because that traditional Dante network um, it has served us well, but the big ask from lots of people uh, when we would when we were doing the live events, live training events, people wanted to have a way to lock down the Dante network to only let certain users access certain systems. And that's what DDM does. So uh, you can create users locally in the DDM software, which are maintained on that um, DDM server, or you can uh, use uh, LDAP Active Directory uh, to allow people to use their LDAP Active Directory login to gain access to the various Dante domains. You can set that level of privilege, and more importantly, you can prevent the unwanted access in that, uh, you know, to your Dante domains. Now, um, with Dante controller used in a Dante domain manager environment, you know, the, once you enter your username and password, you connect up and you get a little drop down menu there. And we can see in the production studio, this gentleman named Bernie is a domain administrator. And um, you only see those devices. You see that that device's uh, clocking and so forth, that, that domain's clocking information and so forth. So this leads to fewer mistakes. You're only seeing the devices in that system that you're uh, working with. And uh, it's, it's really pretty straightforward from a uh, Dante controller perspective. Um, on the DDM side, you do have system-wide monitoring of all the Dante domains in your system. So this is great if you've got a very large system where you've got 500, 600, or, or greater Dante devices, and maybe you have you know, 50, 70, 100 Dante domains, the DDM server is going to let you know if there are any changes in a, in a domain with regards to connectivity, if a device goes offline, and that's what we're showing here. We've got a microphone offline in the boardroom. Uh, it lets you know, are there any latency issues? Are par packets arriving late? Um, if there's a subscription issue, did, you know, was a, um, sub did a subscription between a transmitter and a receiving device fail for some reason? And if there are any clocking issues. More importantly, it's um, sitting there and the, the DDM server is actually acting as a proxy between Dante controller, the software running on an individual's Mac or PC, and the Dante devices enrolled into these Dante domains. So when someone logs into the stadium and makes a change to a subscription, when they check that uh, uh, cross point in Dante controller on their laptop, that command is sent to the DDM server, the DDM server executes that. So the DDM server knows who made the changes and when they did it. Uh, there's also SNMP support. So the DDM server can provide information to third party dashboards for your IT department, uh, not only on the status of all the Dante domains, but on the DDM server itself, or if it's uh, running in what we call high availability mode where you have a backup DDM server, it lets you know the health of uh, the DDM server, the services running on it, its connection to various external services like uh, LDAP Active Directory, uh, email servers and so forth very powerful program. Um, so um, the, the, the other key thing, I mentioned this earlier, crossing subnets has always been, you know, the, the, the holy grail for Dante. Uh, I've been with the company uh, going on eight years, or excuse me, finishing up my seventh year. Uh, but uh, um, people have always asked for this and DDM allows that to happen. Uh, and uh, again, uh, you, your devices can exist in, uh, in multiple subnets. The DDM server, all it does is it configures the clocking for those devices in that multi-subnet domain. Once that is all set up, Dante, uh, the Dante devices, again, they remember their settings um, like a traditional Dante network. If the DDM server goes away, gets powered off, something happens, it gets disconnected. Your, your audio still functions. Now you do lose the ability to connect up to the 
uh, system since there is no DDM server to authenticate you. Um, but uh, again, that's what we have high availability uh, mode for where you have a backup DDM server, which will take over as the active DDM server in the case of a uh, server failure. Um, so uh, a couple other key things that happen when we um, enroll devices into a DDM environment is we uh, give you more key, uh, clocking options. Um, and it's, uh, especially for those devices that are running you know, version 4.2 of Dante firmware, uh, they can now synchronize to external PTP v2 multicast clocks. Um, and you know, there are other th cool things that we do in a DDM environment. We allow you to have higher latency settings, but you can configure these clocking options in the DDM browser interface. You just navigate to the domain, go to the advanced settings, and you can choose the uh, default Dante clocking scheme, but you can do a custom version one, version two uh, configuration. Uh, and again, uh, in this example here, the screen grab I'm showing, uh, we've got a Dante device uh, that is, uh, it's this device right here, B2 PDK master, uh, B2 PDK mixer, which is running 4.2 firmware, which is syncing to an external PTP V2 clock, a GPS clock. Um, we've also got uh, the the capacity in DDM in a DDM environment to allow you to to create what we call clocking zones, which really allow you to uh, create. If you've got different subnets, you can create. Uh, zones where they, you know, each subnet will have a, its own clock. And this comes in handy when used in conjunction with like a GPS uh, PTP V2 clock on the network. Uh, typically we see this being done where we've got remote uh, operations between let's say Los Angeles and New Orleans. Um, you know, you've got a subnet at the Los, in the Los Angeles studio, that's got a GPS clock to set to a certain clock domain number the studio, or, or maybe that's where the event is being held is in New Orleans. They have uh, their devices in a different subnet. There's a, a, a Verizon or some provider of connectivity between the two locations. But these clocking zones allow us to use um, you know, GPS clocks or other methods to achieve uh, clocking, you know, jitter-free clocking over great distances. And again, that's what this example or this uh, um, screen is showing here. Again, it could be a, a GPS enabled PTP V2 server, or it could be one that has a word clock output connecting to the back of your Allen and Heath console. Okay, so pretty powerful that what we what we can do with DDM. And uh, finally, we, we've got a, an update coming up in the next few weeks, and uh, there's going to be some bug fixes. But we've got fully customizable user roles. Um, you can in a, a shared audio group where that's how we get audio between different Dante domains. You can now use multicast for devices that are in the same subnet, uh, all kinds of things happening. Uh, but in the next um, week, you are also going to see uh, a big announcement um, concerning the, um, not so much the pricing of DDM, but the scalability of DDM, because uh, we've offered three editions, silver, gold, and platinum for like the past three years. And there have been some pretty distinct cutoffs between silver going to gold, going to platinum. But uh, we've got some exciting news with um, expansion packs and uh, which basically without giving everything away, it allows a silver to expand uh, to even have high availability mode of operation. It allows a gold to expand and so forth. Some very cool things. There'll be a big announcement uh, here, I think on the 12th or the 14th of this month. So keep your uh, eyes and ears peeled. Uh, we'll we'll uh, be announcing that uh, shortly. So with that, I want to turn it back over to Jeff. Um, looking forward to seeing your, um, you know, the, the system examples that you have, the case studies. Yeah. This mixing system. So super cool. Yeah. Thanks, Bernie. Great stuff. And you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of sitting through that intro from in a couple different instances. Uh, and it's cool to see even just over the last couple of years, how much has added and how much Dante has grown, you know, kind of interesting. You even the what is Dante uh, compared to two years ago, there's new stuff that you're adding in there and the, the AV and, and kind of the video side of stuff is super interesting to see where that's going to go as well. Yeah, well, thanks. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about uh, 
you know, this product, because uh, as we talked earlier, it's one of those things where I, I think this is kind of the, the future of, uh, you know, where things are heading. So, yeah, definitely. Well, cool. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get my screen share going here. Okay. I think we should be set there. So, Awesome. As I said, we're going to uh, dig into to three key examples here and talk a little bit uh, deeper about kind of what education, quote unquote, uh, means and why this vertical, I think, is so unique as it pertains to audio system design. I'm going to build a little bit on what uh, Bernie's already talked about, where you look at kind of what the unique spaces are and the unique sort of things within education uh, from a from a physical aspect, but also I think uh, some of the inherent challenges within education and how Dante and Alan and Heath combine to solve those. So here's the uh, kind of point where you would start, I guess, with education. What the heck does this mean? Literally, uh, it might seem obvious or even silly to look up the dic dictionary definition of education, but I think if you stick with this, there's some interesting insights here. Um, education, I thought kind of cool defining it as the action or process um, or educating uh, uh, or being educated, but also this stage of such a process, I thought was kind of a hip way to look at it. And if you further break that, break that down, uh, you pretty quickly see that you kind of have the educators in the various stages of the education process and those being educated, obviously the students. Uh, one of the interesting aspects here is the fact that education uniquely encompasses online and in-person and live and on-demand one way and two way. So that's a pretty wide description there and a lot of stuff that we were packing into. Well, what does it mean to have an audio or an AV system for education? Um, you can easily contrast that with more of a traditional live sound sort of scenario. Um, in that case, you know, we are usually an in-person venue and it's one way to the audience. You know, so while the crowd might be whistling or clapping, it's not the same sort of system design requirements uh, that you'd have for a lecture hall or an online class where things are you know, obviously much more interactive and, and two-way and you've got a plan for that interaction. Um, education uh, in the, this vertical is also, I think, kind of unique in the type of the, the physical venue. Um, again, Bernie kind of touched on these, these different spaces, concert hall, practice rooms, recording studio, they're all physically different. Uh, as well as being conceptually different. And I think if I had to highlight and really kind of get at what we're talking about here and where we might want to dig deeper and do a little more brainstorming about, ah, what can we do to, to better provide uh, very sound, pun intended, um, <laughs> solutions in the education space, one of the things I think is, is tricky is the range of audio expertise that system operators might possess. So the, the math professor at the school walking up to a podium may only have really elementary audio system knowledge. Across the hall, the sound engineer in the campus theater might be at the top of his or her audio game, you know, totally rocking it, knows more than you know, all of us combined is just a rock star uh, mix engineer, but yet, uh, I barely know how to turn this knob up. All of that has to live in that same space. And so certainly a challenge we need to overcome in this broader quote unquote education space. Um, so all of that being said, for today's example systems and case studies, of which I'll, I'll be presenting three, I think it kind of boils down into this sort of a matrix, at least in my head, as we build on those. I think there's kind of these varying degrees of inputs from low to high, different range of outputs from low to high. And as I said, that scale of system control needs and maybe we think of it as skills and capabilities um, from low for novice system operators um, and maybe simple source or volume control all the way up to professional audio engineers with complex routing and mixing needs. So maybe these sort of charts will help to summarize and get our head around that. So I did my best to bring this all together for really what are we up to then? If, we, if we've got a gig, hey, we need this system uh, designed for this education space, educational environment, what are we trying to do? Well, this is a tall order. We're essentially looking for the optimal process for operators of all audio proficiency levels to enable easy control of two-way communication, both live and on demand in a variety of environments. So, Wow, 
I'm tired just thinking about doing that. Uh, certainly easier said than done. But luckily, I think here's where the power of Dante and Ellen and Heath come to the rescue. So again, I'll summarize these examples. We'll get back to this input, output, and control requirements um, as I've presented and how the system solve them. But I think I'll also do my best, and hopefully there's, there's uh, you know, all this lands well and it makes sense. I'll do my best to kind of highlight why Dante and Alan and Heath solutions were uniquely positioned to meet those educational needs. So not just here's a thing, isn't that neat? They bought a lot of gear. We obviously like that They're using Dante, that's rad. Uh, but I'll try to find why Dante was really the choice and maybe the only choice that was uh, workable for those requirements. And similarly, why Allen and Heath is really the only option they could have gone with. So, so let's go, we'll dig into this first one here. This is uh, an example uh, sample system design that features the AHM64 matrix. This has some distributed audio inputs and speaker outputs and wall mount control points. Um, so this again kind of starts to hint, hint at that various input sources and control, you know, master volume levels, et cetera, but make it easy enough for anyone who has the skill set to operate a 1970s home stereo could operate. So as we look at this, again, a similar sort of example is what Bernie pointed to. Uh, we've got a few different zones. We've got some spaces here, maybe a, a music school building or a theater and, and things are coming in and out. Uh, we've got the main admin office or reception area with paging and system control. Um, I'm assuming in this diagram, it would be via custom control app running on their office iPad or Mac or PC, perhaps even the new CC7 or CC10 control touch screens, uh, which we just uh, announced. Um, so wall mount IP1 controllers, again, kind of looking at this, you can imagine in one of those spaces, uh, a music theory professor that easily walks up and pipes in a local source for everyone to listen to, controls the microphone level at the lectern as needed. Um, and if you needed to expand in that space, say the, the jazz combo class or intro, intro to jazz uh, improvisation, they need a couple mics tack into that 16 by four wall mount. So pretty straightforward, uh, not reinventing the wheel or getting too nuts with this when we just look at it as a sample, almost generic diagram. What I think it's really interesting and back to that question of you know, what is education, let's see how a similar system was designed and deployed out in the field. And maybe in a space that you wouldn't necessarily look at and say, ah, education. So this first case study is from the Brave Thinking Institute. So this is a California-based organization that presents live events, online courses, coaching programs. Um, they recently underwent a system upgrade. So they designed and implemented really cool AVL solution here with a company called Tech Arts uh, that incorporated in Allen and Heath AM, HM64. So just as the, the sample sh uh, diagram showed, uh, really handling all audio to various streaming platforms, as well as communications between educators, students, broadcast, and remote staff. So kind of similar to how our generic education system design diagram showed different zones with different local audio control. This was unique in that the Brave Thinking Institute broke out those different streaming production functions into different zones uh, via Allen and Heath uh, solutions and Dante. So expanding beyond the usual Zoom presenter view we've all become accustomed to over the past year, and I'm looking at right now, uh, educators at Brave Thinking Institute regularly view four screens showing different Zoom rooms with 49 people per screen, along with two additional screens for confidence monitoring, PowerPoint, keynote, notes, active timers, program views. Uh, you know, they've got crazy sort of setups here going on. And kind of cool GPIO functions within the AHM64 allow for tally indication when mics are muted for additional confidence and clarity. So again, this is striking at that very complex technically, but very easy from an operational standpoint. And I think this image too is a great example of a space that might not look, you wouldn't glance at it and say, oh, that's clearly a university education setup. Not really, it looks kind of like a you know, a 10 by 10 booth at a you know, trumpet convention or something. I don't know, a weird convention space. Uh, but it's exactly 
uh, checking all the boxes for education requirements. There is a educator, there's interaction, there's this uh, complex and, and really robust you know, exchange of ideas that's happening. So absolutely education. And I think the cool part here is keeping those educators engaged and in control of frequent and unscripted Q&A, which to me sounds like a classroom, um, and Allen and Heath IP6. So this allows for adjustments, in this case, actually of a T-coil volume, uh, wired and remote comms and talkback status to staff members or remote speakers. So this is what the, the educator would be operating. Um, and so as noted again, one of those unique aspects um, is this two-way communication. So simplified yet powerful. So the source is clearly labeled here with digital scribble strips and intuitive buttons for muting and knobs for volume control. So kind of cool. Um, yet, over in the control room, six lo local operators manage the operations alongside 20 offsite uh, remote Zoom moderators for multi Zoom seminars. So, this Dante based system of four channel and eight channel comms actually combines in here uh, and allows for various sets of event production audio. Uh, streams and feeds as needed. So, between the technical staff from local to remote, from talent or educators to tech, from educators to remote, et cetera. So all those various permutations uh, and a duet of Allen and Heath IP8 remote controllers combined with the AHM, an array of sure wireless microphones, a Blackmagic Constellation 8K video switcher and numerous Zoom room computers to complete this rig. So kind of cool how they've, they've made this all happen. You know, and according to Jason Vandergrift, who's the designer and technical director at Tech Arts, really helped bring this together. Um, you know, we made sure to, to highlight that the needs of this particular project were quite interesting and they had fun getting creative with the HM. So for instance, the HM supplies a 20K sine wave to trigger a comm call with a specific light color to alert the control room that the key presenter or educator is calling above someone else. So obviously as the speaker educator is generally the most important uh, in this sort of uh, interaction, the studio has to be alerted. They they got to know how to mix and manage that. So those sort of details matter. Uh, you know, he goes on with this quote that it's odd producing an event for five thousand people you cannot see, uh, but with AHM and some clever Dante system design, we've made it feel comfortable for everybody. So that's certainly cool to hear. And I think this first education system example was a great way to really look at the AHM. Uh, audio matrix in enabling this two-way communication or a 5,000-way communication uh, while giving expert audio operators tons of control and putting just the key elements into the hands of educators or talent uh, for real-time adjustment of levels and mutes as, as might be needed. So um, I think it, it also is important to note that all of this, and I think maybe as far as we've got into this <laughs> uh, webinar so far, we haven't really talked about audio quality. Now, obviously there's cool stuff happening with all the audio, but all of this is at 96K, tons of flexibility and control options. It doesn't mean much though, if it all sounds bad. So clearly, and, and we're pretty confident with this claim I'm about to make, but I think compared to other options in the audio matrix space, uh, other devices out there, AHM is on a completely different level when it comes to sound quality and audio pedigree. Um, you know, the, the mic pre's you might see in a world-class touring stage um, in AHM. So, so I think a, a unique aspect there. Obviously with Dante, and as Bernie said, we're looking at thousands of Dante devices versus maybe dozens of devices and options that you might have with other uh, audio over IP protocols. So uh, this one, just to, to put in my cool little uh, speedometers there, pretty low on channel inputs and outputs when you kind of look at audio microphone inputs, um, but I think quite high on the control requirements. So Alan and Heath and Dante, combining for the win in this uh, first example here. Um, if we jump forward uh, into the next example, um, I think we kind of can build on each one of those and see the thermometers go up to the, the next highest level and, and we keep building. But before I do that, I do want to actually go in a bit of a tangent. So here's another interesting thought. We, if we go back to the, the this first example, um, we take a little detour. So we've got these little rooms 
we've got a room designed with digital IO connection via the DT164W in the wall and the IP1 controller. Um, but how else might we design this particular box in the design? So what if we didn't have the budget to handle a DT164W and IP1, but we still wanted Dante audio in the space? Well, I don't even think Bernie knew I was about to do this, but I'm gonna let the cat out of the proverbial bag and announce a totally new Dante enabled product. So hopefully everybody's sitting down and ready for this major unveiling that will shake the core of the audio industry. What is this new Dante enabled device that gives us another option for that box? Well, any analog mixer. So easily sub out the DT wall box and IP controller with an analog console like the Zed pictured here um, and pair it with the uh, relevant Dante AVO input or output adapter for a very cost efficient solution, possibly even leverage you know, analog gear that's already in a particular space. We also just announced um, a series of Dante breakout boxes that Alan and Heath directly manufactures that could be done to do a very similar uh, sort of um, option in taking an analog console, getting that over into Dante and back and forth at a very cost uh, efficient um, low barrier to entry. So I think those sort of things, just kind of a, a cool way to look at. This is the fully digital kind of slick way that you would do it, but that doesn't mean there aren't other options. I think that actually points to just how powerful Dante really is as a platform. Yeah, grab that analog console. We'll make that work too. Pretty cool. So moving on to the next example here, I think this is really uh, much more common these days. And again, Bernie did give this example of the music or media department. And maybe in this uh, generic design, you kind of see we've got more IO, more outputs, inputs on the SQ consoles and on the DM32 in this case. Um, yeah, a few more outputs. Now it's a main PA and a hundred volt constant voltage system. We, we kind of stepped up. Maybe there's a Crestron panel for third party control. We're getting a little fancier here. We've got some personal monitoring, so on and so forth. Obviously, Dante controller, virtual sound card. Um, and so let's move from generic what you can do to what someone has done in the university education space. Very similar sort of uh, system design um, at Regent University. So this brings a new level of audio control in front of house and broadcast uh, to Regent University Communication and Performing Arts Center and the Regent University Chapel. So again, kind of uh, echoing what Bernie mentioned about this distance mixing and the, the power of Dante and the power of Alan Heath to be able to do some interesting things at a distance here. They took a pair of DLive S7000 control surfaces and DM64 mix racks and essentially bridged two spaces with network interconnectivity, uh, flexible enough to support everything from small educational and even worship services to concert level performances. So Jack Guida of uh, the Virginia-based RTW media uh, firm and uh, Regents Virginia campus um, you know, kind of everybody working together under the direction of Chief Audio Engineer Justin Fugit, pictured there. Um, according to Justin, they expanded their network capabilities to include Dante, Maddie, and Alan and Heath's proprietary Giga Ace formats as well as Wave. So, as Wave, it's kind of cool seeing all of that stuff come together. And, and Justin adds, now we can share audio back and forth cleanly and without problems. In the past, we had clocking issues and needed converters. Today, things are just as simple as pressing a button, regardless if I'm sending a couple of channels or a full mix between consoles. So I think that's one thing we'll highlight here is kind of the ability to not just say, well, we're, we've got Dante, we're sticking with Dante, but I think really it's one of those two plus two equals five. You know, we Once you've got Dante, it can play with other platforms and protocols and kind of be a nice way to bridge, particularly when you've got something like a DLive in the mix that can handle sample rate and format conversion very slickly, uh, very, did I just invent an adjective? Slickly? Slick, very, it's cool. I'll just put it that way. So. Anyways, I think this is the hippest part of this install. So as I noted, these DLive systems are also accessible via Regents Network. So as Justin notes, this can be a real lifesaver. With students sometimes at the helm, problems can arise. So 
with DLive Director, a multi-platform editor and control software, I can securely log on to the university network, get into the DLive systems and correct the situation from any remote location. So that could save the day for a student and become a true real-time on the job learning experience. So I think that's kind of hip. And again, as Bernie noted, the uh, increase of things happening at a distance and remote uh, support that's necessary directly with DLive Director, but also over something like, you know, Dante, where you've got everything wired and able to control remote access, system status, and be able to, to manage things in that way, I think is really hip. So the region has a highly flexible system for education. And speaking of education and being flexible, um, you know, I remember when I was a kid, one of the key valuable life lessons in kindergarten and maybe first grade, play nicely with others. So again, as noted, I think this educational aspect in which Dante uh, really shines is somewhat similar, this idea of playing nicely with others. So uh, this is, we got actually pretty recently a little follow-up from our friends at Region, and they shared how they were pivoting and tackling challenges they faced due to COVID. So folks remote, more streaming intensive activities, the need to cross and bridge and play nicely with other technologies, and it was no problem. So the vision they had when the system initially was installed years back, this idea of a cross-platform and protocol utopia uh, really has come true. So I like this, you know, Maddie and Dante and Alan and Heath protocols playing very nicely together to serve a number of functions from full back to comms to multi-tracking to remote production. So I thought this was a great way to show uh, just how uh, sophisticated in advance you can get. Obviously, I'd love to be able to toot our own DLive and Alan and Heath horn here, but I think it's it's really the capabilities of Dante and, and that uh, audio over IP power uh, that really puts this playing nicely with others, um, you know, capability kind of into play and, and is at the root of all of that. So pretty cool. Um, so doing the quick summary for region, quite, you know, quite a number of inputs, medium amount of outputs, and obviously lots of control points and complex moving parts all handled across those uh, DLive mix racks and Dante cards and uh, pretty cool. I, I think though the, uh, the conversion and the various protocols uh, is worth noting here. And, ob and obviously that remote management and education, remote education, uh, you know, here's how you mix, here's how you might have got yourself into trouble on the console, the ability to, to help that student right there at the desk to solve, ah, here's your problem, you had it, you know, this output bus or this routing was not quite right. Uh, that's also pretty cool. So anyways, I think this was a great example of that middle tier, quite complex, um, almost there on all of the needles, but We've got one more quick example here. And I think this is where I would really look to be uh, probably the best example I've seen in a while of the power of Dante with input high, output high, and control needs high, all the needles in the red. Uh, and this is really the demands of contemporary house of worship educational environments. Uh, and it, a, a sample generic design with a bunch of inputs and outputs and you see how this starts to grow in complexity and range but i think i've actually got an insane real world system that is out there that puts this chart to shame so sorry sample chart but you're not even cool enough anymore because i believe that action church tops the list as far as putting the power to Dante and Alan and Heath to work uh, to bring about these sort of interactive and engaging educational, and in this case, additionally also worship sort of experiences. Um, you know, founded in 2014, Action Church is just insane as far as their growth rate, uh, leaps and bounds. Uh, when we started working with them, they had a handful of uh, Allen and Heath DLive systems, which is great at one location. Now they're up to four locations and three more over here. And, um, you know, they basically um, you know, start, to, they're just collecting DLives left and right, which we have no problem with. Um, and John Williams, who's their experience director, um, worked closely with church volunteers and the Florida-based Crown Design Group on this latest expansion phase and really worked up this design. Uh, you know, according to John, which is kind of cool to hear, you know, we started with the original install back in November 2018. DLive has been a great platform since day one. 
And we've been blessed to have off the charts growth at the church. When it was time to ramp up further on the audio side, there was no hesitation about going big again with even more DLive. Uh, so thanks, John, for, for that faith in, in the platform and, and awesome to see it continue to grow. And speaking of that growing and the, and the range of the platform, I think it's also neat the, what, what they have deployed is essentially running the gamut of the DLive control surface options. So at front of house, they have a DLive S7000, which is our largest uh, control surface in the DLive family, 216 assignable fader strips, you know, over, so it's 36 faders, uh, over six layers, and two 12-inch capacitive touchscreens. But at monitors, still a DLive, still the same mixed horsepower, still the awesomeness of DLive, they've got a C1500 surface, which is one of the smallest surfaces in the DLive family. So this is 12 faders over six layers. Um, it's actually rack mountable if you wanted to, it's 19 inches wide. So from our smallest to our largest, uh, kind of cool to see both of them being used. You could mix and match these all freely as they have. Uh, they've also added in quite the enviable collection of two 64 by 64 Dante cards, three 128 by 128 Dante cards, uh, a 128 by 28, 128 Waves card, and four 128 by 128 Gigas cards. So they've got just like the, the baseball card collection of actual audio cards um, installed across these mix racks. So full 96K audio network and flexibility and basically in and out whatever format they want. Uh, this is just one of the systems this church has in play, by the way. So, so as I said, pretty insane. Uh, but this does hit back on a recurring theme, similar to what we uh, saw in the Regent University example, going with Alan and Heath and Dante for an initial install core, uh, for lack of a better word there, and then expanding and growing over time and being able to bridge and play with different audio protocols as needed, uh, with Dante acting as that audio over IP home base. So as John noted, quote, if I want to bring something in via Dante and go out with Maddie, it's not a problem. Uh, continuing, you know, we'll spill from our front of house desk or split, sorry, from our front of house desk and move into our broadcast console with Giga Ace, record tracks and playback in Dante, perform audio embedding and de embedding, uh, mux de mux with Maddie. Everything we do seems to require multiple layers, and DLive just stays lockstep with us all along the way. So, Again, super cool and uh, such a, an interesting and unique, I think, application of really just getting all of the moving pieces of those protocols um, all in the same space and, and making it work. Uh, multiple operators in and out of broadcast across a campus, across multiple campuses, from campus to campus at, at a distance, uh, huge productions at scale with a critical audience and breakout spaces and that interaction that we talked about as being a core defining factor uh, in education. Um, yet Action Church really pushes those boundaries of education within a house of worship environment and makes it look easy. So, I hope these examples uh, were helpful and you know, kind of maybe prompted a little bit of a deeper dive into thinking about just what education can mean and what it could look like uh, and why I think it is a unique space. And I hope it's been fun and informative. Um, you know, so obviously, you know, thanks to Bernie for his presentation on the power of Dante as well. And I think as you've seen, we aren't slowing down with our dedication to pushing Dante even further ahead um, as a key element within the Allen and Heath range of products. We've recently added a new trio of smaller Dante breakout boxes, um, and we may even have more Dante enabled products up our sleeves in the very near future. So, you know, thanks for uh, the time here. We do have a, a couple minutes for any questions or comments that may have come up as well. Um, that's what I've got for you today. Cool. I do see some chat notes here. Sweet. Let me see questions wise. If you've got them, go ahead and pop those in. And either Val or Nick will get those to us. Yeah, I'm just gonna jump in. First of all, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, yeah. for, for both of your presentations. Um, I think it's really interesting to see on, on one side um, from, from Bernie at Ordinate how, um, 
uh, how Ordinate are going very much in the direction of um, full flexibility um, moving forwards, but at the same time, um, with that flexibility, making sure that you can control it and not just have something uh, so massive that it's out of control, so to speak. Um, so a DDM allows you to uh, segregate something that's extremely flexible in something that's extremely controllable. Um, and then at the same time, Jeff, you gave some examples that, that showed how, um, uh, thanks to the Dante cards and the Dante um, IO modules from the Everything IO family uh, with Alan Heath consoles, um, but both of them kind of uh, overlap really, really well, both on the Ordinate side, but also on the Alan Heath side. So I, I thought that's really interesting. Yeah, and, and I know as Bernie alluded to, we had some some fun chats and some of the work that he'd done uh, in his his past at another another company, just general DSP work and, and some design stuff that he had uh, handled in the past. And I thought it was also interesting to see that I, th I think maybe Bernie was too far ahead of his time and some of the stuff that he was up to, it's cool to see the, to the tech and the networking speed and the stability of networks and these sort of remote, uh, the combo I think of the remote access and control and the power of a fixed architect architecture of the AHM in the case we were talking about, you know, that it's like the, the vision and the magic that can be uh, you're within a system like that has really the tech has caught up to make that a reality. Um, so it's kind of cool to see those threads combining. Yeah, I remember, um, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, back in like 2005, 2006, when I was, you know, uh, doing, you know, trying to attempt something like this was, you know, back then, you know, drag and drop um, interfaces were, were designed basically to, you know, uh, manage DSP resources. Cause you know, you go back again, you know, 20 years ago, DSP was very expensive. And uh, so you had always, you know, if you used a drag and drop system, you were always keeping an, eye, keeping an eye on the DSP gas gauge. And, you know, you fast forward to now, I mean, uh, DSP is nowhere near as expensive as it was. And so this allows you to have that, um, while, while there have been fixed architecture, you know, DSPs out there, there currently are, uh, there are none that uh, really take the, you know, kind of like the mixing console with all its mixed buses and capabilities, insert points especially, and, you know, uh, an audio over IP network protocol that really allows it, it to bring it all together. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, a mixer channel strip is kind of the ideal uh, signal flow for an audio signal. It's designed, you know, when you go to different console manufacturers, they're all designed the same way. And, you know, so that, you know, with, with the, uh, um, the AHM, you know, it's all done, you know, and again, you can route any signal, especially you can take, you can leverage Dante, bring it into the network, insert things wherever you need to, and you, there's no reconfiguration of the file or recompiling and so forth. You, you've got all the, all the DSP horsepower there. So, and the, and the remote control, uh, you know, like the IP8, uh, you know, and even the, the wall controllers are, I think, uh, uh, right on the money, so. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Uh, very cogent and I think important points there, Bernie. And, and although now, now I might kind of rethink my use of those speedometers or the gas gauge, so just for clarity's sake, yeah, with those control things, when I'm putting it over in the red, that's actually one of the benefits of AHM and that fixed architecture. You're really never in the red. You can keep going as far as the, you know, as many channels and mixable channels as a system can support, and you're not running out of resources. Essentially, that one of the key benefits there is it's designed essentially to operate uh, whether you've got one channel or 64 running, it runs how it runs. You're not watching the, the proverbial gas gauge or the DSP and, re, and remaining resources. So, so maybe I'll have to rethink that use of that, or at least clarify early on that when that red was in my example was way over on the control or the inputs, that doesn't mean the AHM was being taxed you know, beyond its limits or at its edge. You know, it could have easily handled more. So, so anyways, um, yeah, so always fun to, to have that chat. And I think, you know, for, uh, for Bernie, uh, obviously sitting on, on 
more of the odd net side of things, that's where things get really cool is that hardware matching up with the power of that, uh, you know, the software uh, and, and the backbone of that infrastructure and, and what it can bring, you kind of see this exponential effect almost. So yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. We have a question from uh, Dayton and uh, I'm going, he has actually asked two questions and I'm, I might fold it into one, maybe a little bit more um, application specific question. He asked, uh, how does Dante EV, uh, AV sorry, integrate with DDM? And his follow up question was, will we still be on one uh, gigabit networks for the next uh, few years? Um, as video needs a lot of bandwidth um, and, and 10 uh, gigabit networks are, um, are, are recommended. And I'll, I'll slightly turn that question around um, to, to our conversation of today, which is as uh, processing power in matrix mixers becomes more um, performant and, and we end up with much higher channel counts in, in terms of matrix mixers uh, and talking about what we're talking about today in education where we could begin to imagine a single matrix uh, mixer managing a vast education complex rather than having multiple uh, matrix mixers in various locations of, of an education center. Um, how, how do you see things moving forwards in the future? Because obviously, if we were to have an, a matrix mixer that, that might be, I don't know, um, 400 something channels of, the, of, of processing power for an entire complex, that's also going to um, need a substantial bandwidth. So how do you see things moving forwards in terms of bandwidth? Um, and as, as your example showed, we're talking about vast, vast um, infrastructure. Uh, so where do you see that going? Um, well, um, I can you know, speak to the, you know, the, the Dante AV integrating with DDM. That will be coming um, uh, with, with a DDM update uh, later on this year. But you know, regarding you know uh, networks and bandwidth and so forth, um, you know, it's going to be interesting because while like on, on the Dante AV side, it's built for gigabit networks. But when you start getting up to 4K, 444, you know, 60 uh, uh, signals, you know, bandwidth is pushing the limits. You know, it's like 950 you know, megabits. So. And with now on the audio side, I mean, 512 channels of Dante audio is roughly like 730 megabits of bandwidth. So, and, and typically in a, a campus environment, the pinch points on the network are when you have, um, you know, let's say you've got, uh, you know, 50 lecture halls, various uh, buildings, recital halls, maybe, you know, there's the music education department, and you've got a centralized recording, you know, studio or, or, or building and you need to get, you know, you know, 3000 change. If the goal is to have 3000 channels of audio be assignable to any of these 20 or so studios, that's where that, you know, 10 gig uplink comes into play. So, you know, and now that's for audio for, for video, that's where things get a little more um, interesting because while yes, there's Dante AV, there's other, you know, uh, protocols, other standards out there that, uh, you know, just go well beyond, you know, a 10 gig network. And I don't know, I, what I see happening is, uh, you know, audio is essentially going to be a round rounding error on, <laughs> on future network designs, because it'll be trivial compared to what the, the, the video side will be. And, you know, this is just my personal observation, uh, pointed out to, uh, uh, by a colleague, colleague of mine was just the uh, incredible price drop in, in like, you know, 25 gigabit switches. <laughs> you know, I mean, when I remember, uh, you know, before I worked at Autonate, uh, I think I was working at Electrosonics at the time, I was looking at get the cost of gigabit switches, several thousand dollars. And now you can go down to your favorite electronics re retailer and, and, and buy them, you know, on the shelf. Uh, and what you're starting to see is, is that, you know, price drop, dramatic price drops happening on like 25 gig, 18 port switches with four 100 gig uplinks. I mean, they were $10,000, then now they're 6,000, they can be had for $6,000 from various switch manufacturers and not just some off brand either, you know, uh, but um, that's what I see happening. I mean, and I do see something happening where, you know, a manufacturer could come up with that, you know, total solution as far as being able to control audio and video around the network. So Jeff, what, is, what do you have to 
say? Yeah, I think it's, you know, certainly the um, doubling of the power of computing, you know, every year, I forget what, initially what the law was, you know, the quote unquote law that, you know, as far as uh, how quickly things were going to accelerate, you know, we've much, much, much quickly, more quickly actually seen the growth of technology and movement of that. So I think however soon we think we will get to that world, we will be there sooner. Um, the, you know, as Val noted, even just with channel counts now, that that's becoming a very interesting topic. And when you start thinking about things like how you're de even designing those systems out and things like our, how our deep processing works, for instance, in DLive and dedicated chips for this thing versus all on one chip and how kind of there's a lot of interesting motion and movement and discussions going on just around that design. But I think you're right that uh, when you look at audio compared to video from a bandwidth standpoint, certainly audio will be a rounding error. I will say though, the, the, the number of channels and the price points of those devices at which you can get those channels and features certainly will start to come down very similarly as you noted with switches. I think lastly, one thing to keep in mind though is it seems like much more quickly than I might've imagined, 96K audio has become table stakes where even just a handful of years ago when we released SQ, there were a lot of people saying, well, why would I want to pay extra? You know, that, you know, it's slightly more for the 96K. What's it doing? I, and only, you know, uh, bats can hear the difference or whatever arguments they had, you know, and it's like, well, now just you need to be at 96K. It's very clear that's where everything's going. I think that's also a benefit we didn't really touch on uh, when we look at, at, at what Dante brings and what Ellen Eve brings. That doesn't mean you need to throw out your 48K stuff. And I think that there's a way to embrace this very quick uh, change in the, in the landscape and very quick progression of technology while being sensitive to the fact that not everybody out there can go and just, oh, well, let me get one of those $10,000 switches. Oh, it's only 6,000 now, I'll get two. Obviously not everybody can do that. And obviously there are churches and schools that have invested in 48K uh, uh, interfaces from Allen and Heath or IO. We make sure that still functions. You can use it. We'll do the sample rate conversion. You know, so I think there's a way to, to be really from a from an OEM and a manufacturer standpoint. It's good to know that Dante does support 48, 96, you know, all the way up to 192. Uh, you know, it's like fine. Wherever it's going to go, we'll we'll be able to get get you there. So hopefully that was not too overly rambling. But yeah, I think there's the the promise that technology brings. And, and I think that at least in my time at Allen & Heath, it's been cool to know we've been, I think, good stewards of that technology and make sure that we're not uh, you know, forcing, you've got to move or you, now your gear is worthless. Um, you know, we try really hard to make sure to bring that um, technology forward as far as we possibly can. So cool, great question. Anything else for us, Val? Uh, no, I mean, I think um, on, on uh, presentations like you've just given, you've been extremely um, thorough. So I think most people have uh, uh, got the info that they wanted to. Um, the only thing I will remind people of um, is, of course, uh, there will be another uh, session of this. So, so check out the uh, schedule on the Alan Heath website. If you want to watch through it again or you have other questions, um, on this topic, you're welcome to join again or even just at the end to pop them in because you've got something specific you want to ask. Um, but also yep. on the Alan Heath website on the registration page, uh, page for the All Install Week, uh, you have the opportunity to uh, get in touch with us to discuss uh, on a one-to-one -one basis any of your projects or future projects. Uh, maybe you've got some, something in mind that you'd like some um, extra information about and we will uh, happily spend some time with you on a one-to-one -one basis uh, tying in your local distributor uh, wh wherever you may be around the world um, for, to discuss your projects in more detail. Um, so uh, just something for everyone here to keep in mind if, if they need to. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks, Val, and particularly thanks, Bernie, for your time. And, you know, always awesome to hear what, you, what you're up to personally and obviously what Odnit's up to 
uh, globally. So look forward to chatting with you again tomorrow uh, and uh, have a great rest of your day, everybody. And we'll see you all around soon. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, goodbye.